Maybe you're familiar with the name William Miller. William Miller is the founder of SDA, Seventh-day Adventists. And he was an American preacher, and he studied the Bible for 14 years. And he came to a conclusion. He was convinced that Christ, the physical return of Christ, the second coming of Christ, would happen on April 3rd, 1843. April 3rd, 1843. And some of his disciples, called the Millerites, believed this so much, and they were convinced that some of these Millerites ran to the top of the nearest mountain. Why? Because they wanted a head start to heaven. They wanted to be close and get ahead of everybody else. While other Millerites, they went to the graveyards. Why? Because they believed that when Jesus would come back, their loved ones would rise out of the grave, and so they wanted to go in partnership to heaven with the ones that they loved. Others went to the outskirts of town waiting for Jesus. Why? Because they believed that if they were to wait on the outskirts, that was more of the VIP line to heaven. But then the next day happened, April 4th, 1843. These Millerites were disillusioned, discouraged. Why? Because this prediction of Jesus coming back had failed. So William Miller made several other predictions because in his calculations, he had a full year of of making predictions. There was a one-year window which they had till March 21st of 1844. And again, he made another prediction, and it failed. So he made a third prediction. His third prediction was October 22nd of 1844, and that failed again. So William Miller, what he was doing is he studied the Bible. He said, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back in this one year. Oops, he didn't come. Let me stretch it out again. Oops, he didn't come out again. The third time, he didn't make it again. Let me stretch it another year and a half in total time. And so there's one lesson that we can learn from William Miller. I disagree with William Miller. But one thing that we can learn from him is that you should not make predictions about when the Christ, Jesus, is coming back in terms of his exact time. Because Jesus says in Matthew 24, 44, talking about the Son of Man, being ready for the Son of Man, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not know. Jesus is coming back in an hour that you don't expect. I guess William Miller forgot to read that part of the Bible over 14 years that he'd been studying it. But we need to ask the question, why was he so motivated about in a precise, exact time of why Jesus, or when Jesus was coming back. I have a theory, and my theory is this, that he believed that when Jesus came back, that it would be a glorious sight to behold, that something special was going to happen on that day. I would even argue that he would want to see Jesus because he studied Jesus. And so we're in Luke chapter 9, starting verse 28. It's entitled, The King's Glory. And the main point that I want to get across this morning is when Christ Jesus, the King, returns, we will see his full and complete glory. When Jesus comes back, we will see his full and complete glory. The parallel account of our text today in Luke chapter 9, you find that in the parallel accounts of Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 1, and Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2. But our text for today is really on the heels of the text that was preached last week, talking about the true cost of discipleship. What is the true cost to follow Christ? And then in verse 28, what we see here is approximately a week later, it could be six Days, it could be eight days, it could be seven days. But Jesus brings his inner circle up this very high mountain. He brings Peter and John and James. And one of the things that we see Jesus doing again in his ministry is that he's praying. Have you ever noticed that Jesus is deeply committed to prayer? 
He's praying all the time. And again, we see Jesus here praying. There's a priority on prayer. We can learn much about the prayer life of Jesus. But this mountain, this high mountain has two locations, and I think the preferred location is Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor. If you can find Lake Hule in your maps, in your Bible, if you can find Lake Hule, H-U-L-E-H, and you go 22 miles north and then east, that is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon. But in our text today, there's four points, important points that we need to see. Number one, the king's appearance in verse 29. Number two, the king's mission starting in verse 30. Point number three, the misunderstanding of the mission in verse 32. And the final point, point number four, God reveals the Christ in verse 34 and following. I'm going to spend most of the time this morning on points one and two. Points one and two. So point number one, the king's appearance. Read with me in verse 29. And as he, Jesus, was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. When we think of glory, especially as Americans, especially as Westerners, we think of glory in terms of athletics. So if you understand track and field, I love watching track and field because why I'm not an athlete, so I love watching people who are athletes. We normally see people who can run the fastest or lift the most or push the heaviest weight in track and field. So when we think of sports, we think of glory in athletic terms, or maybe in business terms, right? America is a capitalistic society. If I can build the greatest business and the greatest empire, then there's glory in that. Or maybe just fame, personal fame. If I could just be famous on social media, then that's glory as well. But that's not the glory that the Bible talks about. In the Bible, the glory that is stated there is a much different definition. The definition of glory in this context is God's transcendent majesty. God's transcendent majesty, which is revealed through radiance shining forth. This is something glorious, this glory. This is, we're talking about the splendor of a king. The glory of a king, one who is kingly, one who is majestic, one who is transcendent. I hope we understand that word, transcendent. Whatever is the highest limit, transcendent is, I can go past that, and the only person that applies to is God. Transcendent. We are talking about the king's glory. Let me give you an example. If you go out to Red Rock in the middle of the night, and you look up at the beautiful night sky, what will you see? You will see constellations. You will see stars. You will see moon. You might see a few clouds. But when we look at this beautiful universe that we're in by God's grace, we say that's glorious. That's glorious what I've seen, what my own eyes have seen. So what we're doing is we're describing something that God has created. But it's completely different to say those stars, that moon, those planets, that universe, those constellations was created by God. And God is glorious. That's a much different meaning altogether. We're not saying it in the adjective sense describing God. We're saying it as a fact God is glorious, that this is his essence, his being, that is his substance. God is glorious. We're saying that as a matter of fact. And so when we see Jesus praying all of a sudden in front of these disciples, which they're asleep at this time, his physical form his face is changed. 
It's altered. That this is not normal what is happening. Jesus' countenance has completely changed all together. And when we think of the parallel account of this text in Matthew chapter 7 or 17, the word there is metamorpho, which you translate in English metamorphosis. Doesn't that sound the same? Metamorphosis, which is a transfiguration of Christ. And in this parallel account of Matthew 17, verse 2, it says that his face shone like the sun. Have you ever looked at the sun? Try to look at the sun without sunglasses. Actually, don't look at the sun without sunglasses. <laughs> I could see it already. The legal department calling First Baptist Church of the Lakes, right? Don't look at the sun without eye protection. There we go. But if you did... You, we understand the brightness of the sun, that it burns our eyeballs. And if we, even if we were to wear dark sunglasses, the sun penetrates the darkest sunglasses. And we see Jesus' face shone like the sun, bright and shining. And as a matter of fact, his clothes, not only his face, but his clothes, they're gleaming, they're glistening, they're shining, they're radiant. It's almost in the sense of like a lightning bolt. You ever seen a rainstorm in the middle of a desert? You see this dark cloud coming and rain pouring down, and you see these bright lightning bolts in the distance, and they're so bright, it catches your imagination. It catches your eyeball. Like you cannot look away because it's glorious, that lightning bolt. His clothes were shining brightly like that says his clothes became white as light. Mark chapter 9, verse 3 says, his clothes were intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. If you were to bleach someone's clothes a thousand times, that whiteness cannot compare to the gleaming, glistening whiteness of Jesus' garments. So this is known as the transfiguration of Jesus or the transfiguration on the mount. I would argue Mount Hermon. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing the revelation of Jesus' deity exposed for his disciples. The deity of Christ is revealed in this setting. We're talking about the king's glory. In John chapter 1, verse 1, that is the proof text, or one of the proof texts, that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And in the incarnation where God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son humbled himself, took on flesh in the incarnation. He took on a real human nature, real human nature. The Council of Chalcedon, A.D. 451, affirmed that Jesus is truly man and truly God. So not only does the Bible say that, but also those who were scholars at the time of A.D. 451. And so Jesus' incarnation, his incarnation actually conceals his glorious deity. His glorious deity. The radiance and shining light of his deity is veiled in human flesh. You know, I try to come up with an illustration that could get this point across. And I thought about 10 different combinations about this glorious deity of Jesus veiled in human flesh. And I failed desperately. How do you describe that so that our human minds would understand that? This is so beautiful, so glorious. I wish I could explain it, but I can't. You know, Pastor Rolo, I love a good illustration. I just have nothing to offer. I have nothing to offer. All I can encourage you to do is believe it. 
believe what you see in God's word, that Jesus is not simply a man, he is the God-man. And when he left his position of glory, he did not leave his deity behind. Jesus is God. He is the God-man. And so as the God-man, this glory is intrinsic to Jesus as the Son of God. Why? Because He's the divine Son. If you're the divine Son, it makes sense to have this intrinsic glory that belongs to Him. And so this splendor of Jesus' deity, as one reformer says it like this, the splendor of Jesus' deity bursts through the cloak of His humanity. So when Jesus is shining brightly, like a lightning bolt in front of his disciples. This is the glory and the splendor of his deity bursting through his humanity. So this transfiguration means that something has been crossed. So when we think of the word transfiguration, and we think of the word trans, we understand that in the American culture today, the word trans has a negative connotation. But the word trans simply means something has been crossed. There is a line that's right here, and this person is crossed from A to B. From natural to the supernatural. From human to divine. From the ordinary to the realm of God. This line has been crossed in this transfiguration. And so... The disciples of Jesus, what they're seeing is a sneak peek. Let me just say it that way. They're having a sneak peek or a trailer. If you like movies, right? We always watch the trailers. What's this movie about? This is the trailer of the glory to come after the resurrection. They're seeing a trailer right now. A preview of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. He came from glory. He humiliated himself. He took on flesh in the incarnation. He lived and died and buried and he was raised again. And as the Bible says, he ascended upon high to receive glory that always belonged to him, that position of glory. And so when we think of glory in the Bible, one example that should come to mind is Exodus 33. Exodus 33. We see God interacting with Moses, which is absolutely spectacular in Exodus 33. The Lord says to Moses, get the people ready. I'm bringing all of you to the land, the land that flows with milk and honey. Be prepared to go. But the Lord says, but I, the Lord, will not go with you. For if I go with you, I'm going to consume you. In other words, I'm going to kill you all. Why? For you are a stiff-necked people. In other words, you're stubborn. You know God's law is upon your heart, and you disregard it. You violate God's word. You violate God's law. And if I'm with you, I'm going to kill you all. That's what God is saying. So God says... You're going to the land without my presence. And this, by the way, this statement that God makes is right after the golden calf incident where God's people are worshiping the golden calf. And remember Moses? He says, or Aaron says to Moses, I don't know what happened, Moses. We threw in gold and poof, this golden calf came out. I'm surprised he didn't die on the spot for lying. And so Israel hears that their God and creator is not going to go with them into the land that flows with milk and honey. So Israel mourns. And then Moses intercedes and he says, Lord, these are your people, by the way. If you're not going to go with us, then don't move us from this place. Oh, by the way, Lord. What makes us different than all the other peoples on the face of the earth 
is your presence with us. Your presence with us is what makes us distinct as your people. And if you don't go with us, don't send us out. God's presence with God's people is what makes Israel distinct. And so Moses, he's desperate and he says, Lord, please show me your glory. And God says, I'll make all my goodness pass by you. But God also says, but you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. It's very clear that the God of the Bible is the God of the universe. And the God of the universe is the thrice holy God. Mankind in his natural state cannot be in the presence of the Almighty Holy One and live. Because holiness and sinfulness is a great recipe for the sinner to die. So God is the thrice holy God. No mere, no mere mortal can stand in God's presence and live. And yet Moses has this wonderful opportunity to see God in his true essence and his true being. And what's amazing about this is Moses gets to experience this without a mediator. Because in normal circumstances, you cannot approach the holy God without a mediator and live. And so normally, for most people, this is disastrous and dangerous for anyone else. But yet God in his kindness and his mercy and his grace puts Moses upon the rock, the cleft of the rock. Remember the great old hymn? The cleft of the rock. And God says, I will put my hand upon you and cover you. You shall not see my face, but you shall see my backside as I walk by. And so God, in his grace, places his holy hand upon Moses. And Moses sees a small glimpse of the glory of God as God walks by. He doesn't get to see God's face, but he's saved from death by God's grace. And so what's important here is this. God is holy and glorious. No person can see God in their natural state and see God in his natural state and live. And so this same glory, this glory that belongs to the Father, belongs to Jesus the Son, and it's being revealed to Peter, John, and James. And they get to live. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says this, He, referring to Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God. Jesus is the shining radiance of God's glory. Jesus is the exact glory of God. His being is the same, and he accurately reveals God the Father. This glory that belongs to the Father belongs to the Son. So in this transfiguration, we see the glory of God in Christ, Jesus, and this glory is revealed to his disciples, and they get to live which leads to point number two, the king's mission in verse 30. Read with me. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So this glory of Jesus shines brightly, and all of a sudden two men appear, Moses and Elijah. And what's amazing about this is Moses and Elijah have been dead for centuries, and yet they show up on the scene in this text in glory. They come from glory, and they're on the top of the mount in glory, talking to the glorious one. In Elijah's role as an Old Testament prophet is to represent God to the people and to deliver God's word, God's message to God's people. Why? So that God's people would turn their hearts back to faithful worship of God alone. And so for Elijah, he's known as the restorer of Israel's religion, as the Old Testament prophet. But Moses is the leader of the Old Testament 
Israel and known as the lawgiver, which simply means that on the Mount of Sinai, God gave Moses the law. Moses came down from the mountain and gave the law to the people. And so he's known as the founder of Israel's religious economy based on the law. But when we think about the law of God or God's law, we normally think of God's law as God is holy, God is morally pure, God is perfect, and that's all true. What God requires, because He's the holy God, what He requires is true. This is all true. But when we think of God's law, we need to think of God's law also as this law given to Old Testament Israel as a nation. And did they obey? Did they obey or not obey is the question. And if they did not obey, how can God's promises from the very beginning of the Bible ever be fulfilled? So how do we go from Moses to Jesus? Then we need to understand the role of Moses. We need to understand his role properly within the Bible. So there are several Old Testament key events, starting in Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 23. Israel is under Egyptian oppression and slavery. They cry out for help. God hears their cry. And God remembers his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. From the time of Genesis 15, which is the promise that's given, to Exodus 12, to deliverance, is 400 years of Egyptian slavery. 400 years under the mighty hand of Pharaoh. And in Exodus chapter 3, God is having an encounter with Moses. Remember? Moses sees this flashing light. He realizes there's a fire. He realizes that this bush is on fire, but yet it's not consumed. And so in his curiosity, he goes to this bush, and then God speaks to him. God speaks to him through this burning bush. And so God says to Moses, you speak to Pharaoh, and let Pharaoh know, let my people go. Did Pharaoh obey? No, he did not. He refused to release God's people. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the holy, all-powerful God defeated the most powerful government in the world at that time. The Egyptian army and Pharaoh, who was head of that empire, he overpowered the greatest human power ever. But he also overpowered the greatest natural power, the Red Sea. For who can part the Red Sea but God alone? So God's promise, or his covenant, is that he would fulfill in ethnic Israel, nationally, to Abraham's descendants, while they, the descendants, must keep the covenant. In other words, let me explain it like this. God made a promise or a covenant. But this covenant is conditional. If you obey God's people, you're blessed. But if you disobey God's people, you are what? Cursed. So if you want to enjoy the benefits and blessings promised by God, you must obey. But if you don't, those blessings will not come. You are actually cursed. And so national Israel is blessed if they obey God's covenant, God's law given by Moses to the people. So if we look at Exodus chapter 19 now, there's a covenant account of Israel at Mount Sinai. God's people are at Sinai. And so the Lord calls up Moses up to the mountain. God says to Moses, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, 
He shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God says to Moses to say to the people, if you obey, you will be my treasured people out of all the peoples in the world. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Moses comes down off of the mountain. He relays that message to God's people, Israel. And this is what they say in verse 8. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. What did they just do? They committed themselves. They just committed themselves before the presence of God to obey everything that God has required of them. And so God promised to bless Old Testament Israel if they obey. They'll be their treasured, they will be the treasured people of God. And so the people respond by committing themselves. What they're doing is they're reaffirming their allegiance to Yahweh, to God. So one of the things we need to understand here is this, that in this covenant, this is not simply about legalism. It's not legalism. This is not about do this and don't do this. What God is doing is this. He is commanding and demanding loyalty unto himself, and God has every right to do that. He is the creator. He is commanding and demanding loyalty unto him alone. So then when we fast forward to chapter 20 of Exodus, the law is now given. But now, in Exodus chapter 24, God's people reaffirm their commitment. They reaffirm their commitment to obey, to submit to God's law and to God's word. But in Exodus 24, 8, here's the key. It says this, And Moses took the blood, and he threw it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So God made a promise. God gave them the law. They promised to obey the law. And then in Exodus 24, verse 8, that covenant is ratified by blood. By blood. Moses takes the blood, throws it on the people, and he commits them. He commits them to obey God's law. But it's connected to blood. It's committed to a sacrifice. It's committed to the death of another thing in this case. So how do we go from Moses to Jesus? This sprinkling of blood, by the way, is an oath of loyalty. It's an oath of loyalty. It's a vow of accountability. You've committed yourself, but that commitment means nothing without the death of another. And so here's the idea. If Israel obeys God's law, but actually disobeys, here's the idea. May we die like this sacrificial animal that ratified this covenant. The same be done to us and more, more also if we don't obey. Whatever happened to that animal, may it happen to us and worse if we disobey. And so it's as if God is saying, you are my treasured people. You are my purified people. You are my pure and precious people. But it's through blood. The blood of another. So the question now becomes... Is national Israel obedient to God's covenant? The answer is no. If you read through the Old Testament, they broke God's law in so many ways, so many times. So if that's the case, how can Exodus 2 and 3 and 19 and 20, how can this be reconciled? So now this is the background to Luke 9, 31, which we're reading today. All, I've done all of that to, under, to help us understand that's the background to Luke 9.31. Because Moses and Elijah, they're on the mount, 
They're having a very interesting conversation, but they're having a conversation about what? About this word called departure. Departure. This word departure actually means in the original language, exodus. Exodus. The exodus is a departure, but the Lord is using this as a euphemism, which simply means departure means death. The departure of Jesus means the death of Christ. And so Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah about his death on a cross in Jerusalem. This is the king's mission. Because in verse 30 and 31, it says, Moses and Elijah, they appeared in glory to talk to Jesus about the cross. About the cross. That's the idea there. And there's two glories that I want to bring to your attention. Two glories here. Number one, for Jesus to go back to glory and to receive his position of glory, as John 17, 5 talks about, he has to go through something brutal and painful, but yet very real. He has to go through the cross to go back to the position of glory. This glory includes the incarnation, the death, the resurrection, and the exaltation of Christ. There is no way to avoid the cross. The cross stands between him and glory, and his face is set for the cross. But there is a second idea when it comes to glory. Jesus' disciples, the disciples of Jesus, receive glory because of the cross. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. What does that mean? Under the new covenant, by blood, those in Christ will reflect God's glory. This inward characteristic which grows and grows and grows in the believer, in the disciples of Christ, this glory, it grows until we receive our resurrection bodies through the cross of Christ. Through the cross of Christ. So Christians, let me say it like this, Christians reflect, reflect God's glory. We reflect God's glory. That's one of the reasons why God created you. God saved you so that you would reflect his glory in this world. And that glory is a characteristic that's on the inside of you, not the outside of you. And that glory grows and grows and grows in one degree to another until you receive your glorified bodies, but it's on the other side of resurrection. It's the other side of the cross. I want to make a quick note here. You remember when Moses came down off of the mountain? The people saw his face, and his face was what? Glowing. His face was glowing. Why? It's because he has been in the presence of God, the Holy One. When he came down off of that mountain, the people saw it and they were fearful. But Moses is not the source of glory. Moses is reflecting the glory of God to the people. Jesus is the source of glory. That's the difference. Jesus is not reflecting the glory of another person. Jesus, as he's shining brightly, is the source of glory. And so God's people see the glory of God in Christ Jesus. And so this exodus, this exodus, this departure, this death is at the cross. And so how does one get from physical Egypt, being a slave, under the oppression of Pharaoh, to a spiritual land that flows with milk and honey, the promised land in Christ. How do you get from A to B? The exodus of Israel was never designed to be ultimately fulfilled in a physical nation, in a national geopolitical nation. The true exodus that the Bible teaches 
is an exodus that is spiritual in nature. The problem is not that we have less weapons than the other country. The problem that we face is that we have sin and that we're oppressed to sin. We're under the slavery of sin and the yoke of sin. That is the problem. And so the problem of sin is resolved in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem was never being oppressed by a geopolitical nation like Egypt. That's never been the problem. The problem is sinning against God who is holy and being enslaved to that sin. That's the problem. That has always been the problem. And so therefore, King Jesus, his mission is to die on the cross. That's the exodus. That's the departure so that his people would be free from sin and received unto glory. So the obedience of Jesus Christ, the obedience of Jesus Christ to God's law merits our salvation. Old Testament Israel, they failed to obey God. It's very clear that Old Testament Israel failed God over and over and over again. It was never about Israel's faithfulness, by the way. It was always about God's faithfulness to Israel, not the people's faithfulness. But this is through God's promise, which is fulfilled in Christ. So Jesus, let me say it this way, Jesus is the true Israel. Jesus is the true Israel. Why? Because he obeyed God's law perfectly, and physical Old Testament Israel failed God repeatedly. And so Jesus is the true Israel who obeyed God, God's law, fulfilled God's law with his own perfect life and his own blood. So the work and role of Moses really pointed to Jesus. The work and role of Elijah as a prophet pointed to Jesus. Jesus, his death and resurrection is for his glory and for our benefit. So that's point number two. Let me quickly go over point three and four. Point three is misunderstanding the mission. This is verse 32. Read with me. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. So this is a spectacular event of Jesus being transfigured. That the glory of God the Father is the same glory that's in Jesus, that's bursting through his humanity, shining in the dark night. That his disciples are missing most of this. They're asleep, they're sound asleep, deep asleep. But when they're fully awake and they rub the stuff out of their eyes, they see the shining brightness of Christ, the shining radiance of Jesus Christ against the backdrop of a dark Palestine sky. And as this glorious event was happening and coming to an end, it's good and right and proper. It's good, right, and proper to sit there in awe and be silent. Ecclesiastes is very clear. There's a time to speak and a time to what? Be quiet. This is a wonderful time to stand there or sit there in awe and be silent, to not talk. But no, Peter can't do it. Peter can't keep his mouth shut. And so because there's an awkward silence, he has this great idea. Lord, Master, I have an idea. When people say that, we know that's a red flag already. I have an idea. I have an idea. And then Peter speaks French all of a sudden. He says, we, me, 
James, John, we, we would like to build three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And the verse says that Peter really doesn't know what he's saying. This is the foolishness of Peter. He should have just stayed quiet. But when we think of the word tent in this verse, the tent is very similar to the tents we have today. It's made out of fabric, maybe out of animal skins. We pitch it up with pipes or sticks or cords. It's a tent. But this word tent is really an allusion to an Old Testament festival that Hebrew males were required to participate in. This is an allusion to the celebration of the Feast of Booths, which is a tent, or the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of the Ingathering. This is Leviticus 23, 36, by the way. And so in the Feast of Booths, which would happen every year, September, October, at the end of the agricultural season, they would celebrate, they would celebrate the, mad, the nomadic character of God's people during the wilderness period. Remember in the wilderness period for 40 years, they would just roam in the desert, not have a home, not have a land. They're not in their land. They don't have a home. And so they're celebrating this nomadic lifestyle and character of God's people during the wilderness period. And what they would do is they would pitch these tents, these simple shelters interlaced with branches. But here's the key that I want to bring to our attention, and it's this. Every seven years of this feast of booths, every seven years they would recite the covenant that was given to them in Exodus 19 and 20. Every seven years they would recite that as God's people, where God and his people were at Mount Sinai during the time of Moses. They would recite this publicly in front of everyone so that everyone would hear and what would they hear? If you obey, you're my treasured people. But if you disobey, you're not blessed, you're cursed. That's what they would hear. Yet, in the New Testament, in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word of God says, And the Word became flesh, that's the incarnation, and dwelt among us. That word dwelt is the word tabernacle or tent and so he tabernacled or tented among us and we have seen his glory glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth so the word refers to the Christ and the Christ is Jesus who took on flesh he tabernacled in the incarnation with his people and so Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the Feast of Booths and the Feast of Tabernacles. So that is why, even though it's implied, that it's not good to build three tents for Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. One reason is you're delaying the cross. Another reason is to place Elijah and Moses on the same level as Jesus. Moses, the lawgiver, is inferior to Christ. Elijah, the Old Testament great prophet, is inferior to the greatness of Christ. Those two offices are fulfilled in Jesus. And so they're not on the same level as Jesus. Moses didn't die for us. Elijah didn't die for us. It is Jesus who died for us. And we praise God for that. Jesus is preeminent overall. So do you truly understand what's happening here? Do you truly understand the mission of Jesus? Have you been a Christian for years but you don't know the mission of Jesus. Can you articulate it? Can you clearly explain it? If not, I want to encourage you, you need to start with the gospel. You need to start with the good news of Jesus Christ. Because if you have all this theology, 
the study of God, which is, should result in doxology, the worship of God, and you can't explain the good news of Jesus Christ, there's a huge disconnect. I don't know how a person can worship God and not know the gospel. You must know what you believe and why you believe it. You wonder why the American church is such a mess today. It's because we can't even do the basic fundamentals one-on-one. We can't even clearly articulate who Jesus is and what he's done for us. We must know what we believe and why we believe it. So do you truly understand the mission of Jesus? If not, you're no better than Peter. Saying, Lord, let me build you a tent because it's my idea. Which leads to point number four. Final point. God reveals the Christ in verse 34. Read with me. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So here's the answer to Peter's question of, Lord, let me build three tents for you. God provides an answer for him. The cloud. This is known as the glory cloud. This cloud overshadowed them. And the natural reaction is to be afraid and fearful. Why? Because they're in the presence of the Holy One. And there's a voice that came out of this glory cloud. This is the voice of God, the Father. This is known as a theophany. Theophany is a physical manifestation of God before the people. This is a manifestation of God. In the Bible, theophanies are usually accompanied by earth shaking, earth moving, fire loud, visible signs, and in this context, a cloud. I am not saying that God is a cloud. I am not saying God is a cloud. Let me make that very clear. But God has manifested himself to Moses in a theophany called the burning bush. God has manifested himself physically to the disciples in a cloud. And so God is not a cloud. But he uses this cloud as a physical sign to reveal himself to the disciples of Jesus and to show his power. So what does God the Father say in this text? He says something very clear, not debatable. You cannot challenge this. This is my son, referring to Jesus, my chosen one. And here's the command, listen to him. God the Father states that Jesus is the Son, meaning there's a divine relationship between God the Father and God the Son. There's a divine relationship. Jesus is God. Jesus is also the chosen one. We should not look at this language simply as describing Jesus and what he does. We shouldn't look at it as that. But we should look at it as Jesus, the chosen one, as an office. Like the Christ is an office. When you're in office, you have an obligation to fulfill that office. And what is the obligation to fulfill that office? Is to live for his people, die for his people, be buried and raised for his people, and ascend to high and intercede for his people. That is his role as the chosen one. He has a very specific mission. Isaiah 42.1 says this about the chosen one, referring to Jesus. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen. So my servant is my chosen one in whom my soul delights. The servant of the Lord language is very technical language, but it's language of this, that whoever is the servant is to be in a position of honor and trust to God. If you're in that office, you hold that title, you must be honorable and trustworthy before God 
to be a qualified servant of the Lord. And we see many servants of the Lord in the Bible. We see Moses, we see Abraham, we see Jacob and Joshua, but we're referring in this context to the suffering servant. That's the chosen one who is Jesus Christ. And so the suffering servant is fulfilled in the work and person of Jesus. And so Peter identifies Jesus as the Christ. That's good, right, and proper. But God the Father identifies Jesus as the Christ, identifies him as the Christ, the Son. Why is that different? Because it's coming from the Father. It's this. God the Father is saying on the Mount of Transfiguration, this Jesus, listen and obey him because he is the regal king. He is the messianic king. He is the king that the Jews have been waiting for all of these centuries. Obey him. Listen to him. He is the chosen one. And so how do we know this for sure? That Jesus is greater than all the rest. God commands Peter, John, and James to listen to who? To Jesus. Not to Mary. Not the Apostle Paul, per se. Not Elijah. Not Moses. Not Abraham. Not David. Not Joshua. I could go on and on and on. God the Father tells the disciples clearly and directly, listen to the king, the messianic promised king. You are to listen to him. He's the only one left once the statement ends. Once the statement ends, you don't see Elijah anymore. You don't see Moses. There's one person standing, Jesus. Do you listen to Jesus? Because listening to Jesus requires your life. Listening to Jesus is not hearing a bunch of information. Download, download, download. Got all the information. Listening to Jesus is hearing him clearly and submitting by obeying his word. You could hear and yet at the same time disobey. But to listen to Jesus is to listen and to respond properly. It's like the old song, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in who? Jesus. Trust and obey. Hear the king and submit to the king. Matthew 4, 17 says this. Jesus is talking. It says this. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what Jesus is saying. Do we listen to that? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what Jesus commands. That's what Jesus is teaching. Do you repent? To repent is to have a change of mind and heart. To have a change of lifestyle. You think differently about sin. You actually think the way that the Bible describes sin, that sin is evil and wickedness. I used to love sin, and when I repent, I had a change of heart. I hate sin. And the God that I said that I loved, but yet in my day-to-day -day living, it proves that I love my sexual immorality more than God. I love my sin more than God, but now it's this. The God that I said that I hated with my lifestyle is now the God that I love. That's what it means to repent. You have a change of mind as it relates to sin. You have a change of mind as it relates to righteous living. That's what it means to have biblical repentance. Have you biblically repented for your sins? Have you turned away from your sins? I'm not saying genuine Christians can't struggle with sin. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is this. Have you biblically repented of your sins? Jesus also says in John 3, 18, whoever believes in him, or John the Apostle says, whoever believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Have you believed? 
To believe in the Bible means I have not 99% trust, I have 100% trust in who Jesus is and what he's done for me. I have full faith and confidence and trust in him. So have you biblically believed in Jesus? Because to listen to him means you understand what Jesus is saying and you actually submit to it. Jesus says, repent of your sin. That's not an option from the king. That is a command. That is an edict from the king. That is a decree from the king. But also, do you believe in Jesus biblically? If you've done both, that's a sign, a good sign, that the Lord has been gracious to you. He's given you a heart, and you truly have a desire to listen and obey him. If not, if not, you need to get there. You need to trust in the Lord. You need to turn away from your sin. You need to quit living for yourself. You need to trust in the one who has lived and died for sinners. There's no other way but Christ. As I conclude here, there's a story of an old janitor and a seminary student. I love this because I'm a former recovering seminary student. The old janitor was reading his Bible. To be exact, he was reading the book of Revelation. And the seminary student in his pride and his theological proudness prowess walks up to the old in his mind uneducated janitor and he says dear old man do you understand what you're reading and the old man says yes I understand it he said do you truly understand it he goes yeah I truly understand it and the seminary student in his pride says well tell me old man what does the book of revelation mean and he says Jesus wins End of story, mic drop. (laughs) Jesus does win. He win when he rose from the dead. He continues to win as he is in glory. And he rules and reigns. And he wins again. Jesus is the winner. Period. And so we praise Jesus, our King. He is glorious. He has a very specific mission. But sadly, many today misunderstand his office and misunderstand his mission. And yet Jesus is the chosen one. He's the son of God who lived and died for those who repent and trust in him. So sermon in a sentence. Jesus is the glorious king and his full glory will be revealed. And in the meantime, this is how we apply this text. In the meantime, We must tell others about the king who saved sinners through a bloody cross. You must be able to clearly articulate the gospel. Because the gospel is the good news of Christ, what he's done for sinners through a bloody, gory cross. We are forgiven through the shed blood of the Holy One. And we praise God for that. Let us pray.